Hello, friends. It's been a little bit since I did one of these real-time question and answer videos. If you're not familiar with this series from me, basically, I show you the process of me working on a piece with real-time footage. Of course, bits and pieces have been edited out just for a more concise viewing, but nothing has been sped up. Everything you see is in real time. And all the while, I answer your questions related to art, life, and pop culture. I have a number of these videos out now using different mediums, so if there was a question that didn't get answered or a process you're interested in, I might have already tackled it in a previous video. And I have compiled them into a playlist for you to check out, and I will have that linked in the description. So feel free to bust out your own art supplies or grab some snacks, whatever you'd like, and have me, you know, hanging out with you in the background. And um, yeah, let's get started. So before I get into the questions, I wanted to talk about the piece that I'm working on here. So in the previous Q&A video, I did a portrait painting that had a sun theme. And when I created that piece, I had done this sketch as a pairing for it. So of course I wanted to do something related with a moon theme. And so this sketch has been ready to go for quite a while now, but you know, things just got busy and it just didn't end up being a priority, but now I'm finally getting around to painting her. And like the previous painting, I did the sketch digitally on my iPad using Procreate, and then I printed it out and transferred it onto this wood panel, which I've already gessoed and primed in advance. Which, by the way, I have shown this process, this like transfer method process in a previous video, which I will link in the cards in the top right hand corner if you're curious about how I did that. And yeah, I painted this gal using acrylic gouache. And as always, the art supplies that I'm using in this video will be listed in the description. So now with that out of the way, let's get on to the questions. And so for the first question here, we've got, how do you approach starting a new medium? So I have been using many different mediums for a long time that I came into each of them in a variety of different ways. So for example, colored pencils was the first medium I really got into when I was younger, besides obviously graphite. And I think I remembered just very closely analyzing other artists' work that I admired. And I tried to get an understanding of them and try to kind of replicate the way that they were approaching it. Because at the time I was very much into anime and the standard at that point was Copic markers and I couldn't afford them and so, colored pencils was something that was a little bit more accessible to me. And then at some point I realized that watercolors could also have a very similar look to Copics, but was had a, you know, a variety of price points. So at some point in high school, I picked up some cheap watercolors and because I was trying to emulate a different medium with watercolor. So I was trying to like mimic these Copic marker drawings with watercolors, I basically just had to, ex you know, jump in with both feet and experiment with them. And because at that time when I was in high school, like YouTube tutorials, like, I don't think that was a thing. Like, I don't recall that being a thing. So I just had to teach myself basically. And then gouache was something that was introduced to me when I was in college, but the style and technique that was taught to me from my teacher was for like a very flat graphic approach, which over time I changed and developed my own methods for using it in a more rendered way. And so technically I was taught how to use it a little bit, but for the most part, that was also kind of a self-taught thing in terms of the way that I use it now. So basically a lot of the mediums that I regularly use, I did a lot of experimenting to figure out how to use them and what worked for me. However, I understand that some people want that extra help and guidance when starting out. So honestly, I think that watching YouTube videos or taking Skillshare classes is a great way to approach something new. Back when I was in high school, like I said, these types of resources just weren't really available to me. But now in this day and age, there is so much free or affordable content to teach you how to do literally anything. 
And something that I think is important to note about this is that I would highly recommend checking out the process from multiple sources or multiple artists. So for example, if you're interested in trying out watercolors, watch videos from several artists rather than just one. This way you avoid directly copying someone, but you also get an insight to different methods and styles. There are so many different ways to approach an art medium and some methods work for one artist, but may not work for another. So it's important for you as a newbie to see all these possibilities, or at least know that you're not limited to one approach if it doesn't work for you. But most importantly, I really think you just have to play around with it. Realize that you're new and it's not going to be perfect or easy right away, but you'll never really know how to use a medium until you actually use it yourself. Two versus palette watercolors. I have a pretty detailed explanation on comparing these two in one of my Patreon videos, but I will do a summarized version here for you guys. So tubed versus pan watercolors really comes down to personal preference. I actually really enjoy using both and I don't think one is better than the other. If you're someone who likes to work with a minimal color palette or want to mix large quantities of the same color, tubed probably makes more sense. I know Furry Little Peach has said in one of her videos that she prefers tubed watercolors because in her opinion, she thinks that the colors appear more vibrant. But that being said, I have definitely achieved pretty saturated colors with pan watercolors too. So that's just her personal preference. If you want to use many colors at once, or you want to have something that's easily can be traveled with, you know, compact pan watercolors would probably be more suitable. There are so many other nuances and pros and cons to both, but that's just the first things that come to mind. And honestly, even if you buy tubed paints, you can squeeze them into an empty palette and then also have pans. So it's very versatile. I really don't have a, you know, one is better than the other reason. <laughs> is it normal to have a hard time using gouache due to being used to watercolors? Yes, absolutely. They are very, very different mediums and require different approaches. So I think that it's very normal to have difficulties transitioning from one to the other. With watercolors, they are a transparent medium and is ideal from working light to dark. Whereas gouache is inherently an opaque medium and is generally quite thick, especially compared to watercolors, and it can be used both light to dark and dark to light. So don't feel too bad that you are you don't have the hang of the medium right away. I personally have been using both mediums for a very long time and I still experience difficulties when I switch between the two mediums. So. Yeah, totally normal. How do you keep practicing without burning out? I think that while practicing your fundamentals is definitely important for your development as an artist, you also want to continue to feel the joy and have fun when you're creating art. So I would say that if you're finding that you're getting bored of practicing, then just switch to working on something different and something that's more enjoyable for you, whatever that may be. Another thing you can do is switch up the medium. I think that is a huge reason why I like to work with so many different mediums is because I find that it keeps me more engaged and interested. So if, you know, I've been working with watercolors for a while and I'm kind of getting bored with it, then I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just switch to gouache or color pencils or something else. Either way though, don't forget to just allow yourself to take breaks from making art altogether. We are only human and we can only be producing, you know, new content all the time. So if you are feeling burnt out in general, just, you know, take a break, watch a movie, read a book, just absorb some kind of inspiration without actually having to like work on something. And I think that is a huge help in furthering your art as well. Did you ever want to stop doing traditional art and switch to digital? If you did, what made you stop? I don't think I ever fully wanted to stop doing traditional art, but when I was in college for graphic design, I did spend most of my time creating stuff that was digital. And at that time when I actually thought I was going to pursue a career in design, 
I assumed and had accepted that most of the work that I would do would likely be digital. In the graphic design world, it's just more practical to work digitally. And obviously in a lot of cases, it is a requirement. But I think that in realizing this, that's probably part of what allowed me to understand that I didn't want to be a graphic designer in the end. The idea of, you know, creating vector logos, text layouts, brand campaigns, these are all things that are required to be done on a computer. And the thought of it just did not excite me. I absolutely love the tactile experience that comes with traditional art, like being able to mix my own colors, hold a paintbrush, feel the texture of the paper, like watch, you know, the paints transform on, a, on, on the page. Like these are things that are just so much more exciting to me and so much more engaging. I find that whenever I'm spending a lot of time working on something digitally, I just kind of get bored. <laughs> so yeah, I think for me, traditional will always be my, my preference, but of course I still create digital work and there's a lot of benefits to it. And I don't think that I would ever you know, not create any kind of digital content. It's just not really possible. But I will also say that there are tons and tons of digital painters out there that create amazing, amazing things. And I, you know, me talking about how much I love traditional work does not take away or invalidate the amazing things that other digital, primarily digital artists make. But this is just my own personal creative preference. Do you do a lot of planning before paintings or do you just dive into it? It definitely depends on the piece. So if it's going to be more complicated and involved, then yes, of course, I will spend time doing some planning. So if it's going to have a complicated costume or background, I'll spend lots of time looking for inspiration and gathering reference photos. and. It's really, really crucial for things that involve elements that I may not be familiar with, like landscapes, buildings, um, things like armor, animals even. You know, there's so many things that, even if I've drawn it before, will still require me to have some kind of reference point because I can only do so much with doing it from the top of my head. And typically I will also do all of the planning digitally, either on my iPad using Procreate or on my computer using Photoshop. And this allows me to freely sketch out different thumbnails, work out composition, poses, backgrounds, and experiment with different color palettes. If it's just a simple portrait or something that's in my sketchbook or generally just like a low pressure illustration, then I'll just, you know, jump in without the digital planning. But even with those, I usually have some kind of inspiration or a reference photo to launch off of as a starting point. Any tips for creating backgrounds that don't compete with the artwork? If you're creating an illustration that has a figure as the main focal point, you want to find ways to give it more emphasis so that the viewer's eye pays more attention to it. So I think the most common approach is to have the figure or focal point of the illustration to have the most contrast and saturation, and then have all the surrounding elements and background to have less contrast and be more muted. That way the figure is standing out more than the background is. What are color combinations you tend to use a lot? Definitely pinks, purples, and blues. If you take a look at my Instagram, uh, profile page, like for like three seconds, you'll definitely see that pretty quickly. Um, there's just, I don't know, there's something very calming and soothing about that color palette. If you could only use one color of paint ever again, what color would you choose? So many of you probably already know, but baby pink, or as some might say millennial pink is my favorite color. But I would say if I could only use one color, I, might actually go with blue. I think that it is a very versatile color and you can get a really wide range of values with it as well. What's the worst part of being an illustrator? 
So there are a lot of different types of illustrators, but if I were to speak on behalf of the type of illustrator that I am, the worst part of it is definitely all of the business related tasks that are required. So answering emails, shipping shop orders, product slash supply research, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So basically all of the things that are not actual painting or drawing elements of this position. You'd be surprised at how little time an independent illustrator actually spends illustrating. <laughs> how long do you spend drawing each day? It depends on the day. I do not have a structured schedule whatsoever. And like I just mentioned, I have to do a lot of different things to do what I do. <laughs> so basically some days I will not draw at all. And some days I could be drawing slash painting for like four hours. It really varies quite a lot. What's been the hardest thing last year that you struggled with your art? So I discussed this a little bit in my 2021 art goals video from the beginning of January, but basically last year was the first time I regularly put out a YouTube video almost every week. And so that really changed a lot of things about my art creation. When I film my art process, I have to be really self aware. So I have to make sure I'm not turning the page, make sure my head is not in the frame, keep an eye on the camera battery, etc. I also, you know, I'm trying to remember every single art supply that I use because someone's going to ask. Sometimes I have to try and like objectively understand my process so that I can explain it for a voiceover later. And all of these things can be really challenging because I think by nature, I am a fairly intuitive painter. So like having, you know, my brain being pulled all these different ways, just like changes the way that you work. And so because of that, that was the reason why most of the work that I made last year was portraits because it's just more straightforward to create. Whereas when I look back at the, bo the body of work that I made in 2019, I feel like I made more interesting pieces because I wasn't, you know, having my time split between YouTube. And don't get me wrong, I really do love being on YouTube and the community that we have here in so many ways has been life changing for me in a good way. I do not regret making a YouTube channel whatsoever. If I didn't enjoy YouTube, I wouldn't, I would stop doing it. But that being said, it is a double edged sword that I am still trying to find a good balance with. But I think that having this kind of awareness about, you know, my content creation is definitely the right step in uh, a good direction. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. And I am, you know, everything is a work in progress. <laughs> Do you think technical difficulty is important in a good piece of art? No, I don't think it's that important because ultimately, Art is subjective. And so because of that, there is such a wide array of variances in what is to be considered, you know, quote unquote, good art. You know, one artist can spend months on a hyper realistic oil painting and another artist can spend one hour on an abstract minimal drawing. And while the time and spent the, the time spent and the result of each piece is going to be vastly different, I don't think it necessarily means one is better than the other. It's just more about people's personal taste and preferences. So yeah, I think that, you know, so long as it's not harmful in any way, any art is valid. Music you listen to while painting. Yes, I don't think I ever not listen to something while I'm painting or drawing. The only times I'm working in silence is when I'm recording a process and talking at the same time, but that doesn't even hop happen very often. So if I'm not listening to music, then I'm usually having a YouTube video playing in the background, live stream, TV show, or just, you know, something in the background. 
And in terms of what music I listen to, uh, it really varies quite a lot. Uh, pretty much just, you know, whatever artists that I'm interested in at the time. Or I also recently made like an anime opening and ending theme song playlist of just like various animes that I enjoy. It's very nostalgic and fun. Uh, and then I also have like a couple throwback playlists that I've made too from like 90s and early 2000s. So it really is all over the place. What kind of weather gives you more inspiration and why? So in terms of my artwork, I feel like I incorporate pretty much all varieties of weather into my pieces. I love adding like motifs of suns, rainbows, clouds, moon and stars to my portraits. So pretty much all of the above in that regard. But I do feel like I'm more motivated to work when it's sunny out. I think that for one thing, it helps me feel more awake. And two, because the natural sunlight is just definitely the best lighting, especially when I want to film or photograph my artwork. Where do you get the inspiration for characters? Why do you draw the types of girls that you do? So talking about inspiration always feels so daunting because I feel like it comes from all elements of a person's life, whether they are conscious of them or not. But to just like rapid fire some things that come to mind, I am inspired by fashion, beauty trends, pulp culture, as well as, you know, fantasy slash mythical type beings. I also draw inspiration from nature, art history, as well as current contemporary artists. And the characters I illustrate, I think, reflect all of these different interests coming together. I am particularly drawn to femme characters who are both fierce and feminine at the same time. And in some ways, I think that they can feel like an extension of myself or at least a projection of what I wish I was. Do you ever get inspiration from your dreams? Unfortunately not. I actually almost never remember my dreams. And when I do, they're extremely mundane, like extremely, like I went to the grocery store and I forgot my wallet. <laughs> I often really envy people who remember their dreams because usually they just sound so fascinating. But my friend once joked to me that he thinks that maybe the dreams that I do remember are so mundane because I use up all of my creative brain power during the day that so that when nighttime rolls around, my brain has like nothing creative left to offer me. <laughs> I know you draw lots of original characters, but do you have any with fleshed out world slash stories? No, I don't. So I've never considered myself to be a narrative storyteller. So I've never spent any time fleshing out characters or creating detailed worlds for them. When I illustrate characters, I do keep in mind like what kind of feeling or personality I want to portray, whether it be, you know, like a soft expression or something fierce and dynamic, but I don't really go much further beyond that. I definitely admire people who are narrative storytellers. There is something really exciting about that, but there's just never really been a story for me to tell and I'm totally okay with that. Something that I have recently wanted to dip my toe into though is creating original characters, but purely for me to just draw on a recurring basis. I had it in my head that if I were to create original characters that there had to be some kind of story, but I think that it might be fun just to have original characters for the fun of it. How is the art scene in Toronto? This is an interesting but tricky question because much of my career is based online and I don't really have any experience with other cities. So anyway, as, my, um, as many of you know, I currently live in Toronto and have been for quite a number of years now. When I first finished college and moved here, I realized I didn't want to be a graphic designer, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do otherwise. So for a little while, I dipped my toe into a few different things. And one of them being the idea of the, you know, artist who would show in art galleries and art markets. The great thing about being in any big city, I think, is that there are a lot of different opportunities. 
So with Toronto, there's definitely lots of galleries and there's many different events that happen throughout the year. The problem is, is that there's a lot of competition and the work you make may not suit certain venues or spaces. So when I was trying to do like the art gallery thing, I just, the, the type of work I do is not really what they're looking for. And so eventually I figured out that anime and comic conventions made more sense for me. And thankfully Toronto has quite a few of them. Not right now, of course, but hopefully we can do those again one day. And then outside of that, there's also tons of art supply stores, printers and resources like life drawing and things like that here in Toronto too. So all in all, not too bad, especially as someone who doesn't drive, it's great to have access to all of these things via public transit during non-pandemic times. Would you like to work on a movie? So if I were to ever work on a movie, hypothetically, I think that I would be most suited for standalone images. So I think that it would be pretty cool to create illustrations that would function as movie posters or promotional material, or perhaps it would be cool to work on more of like the character design elements of a film. But of course, this is not a career path that I'm actively seeking out, but was were to happen somehow. That's where I hypothetically would fit, I think. Have you ever thought about doing your own version of the tarot cards? It would be amazing. Well, thank you for saying that. I think that's very nice of you. Um, this is something that a number of people have suggested to me. And while I think tarot cards are super cool, that would be a massive project that I am unwilling to commit to. I don't know how many cards there are, but I know that there's a lot and I do not have the patience or dedication to like commit to something that long and ongoing. <laughs> how do you get the confidence to show your face and speak on YouTube? So this is definitely something I still struggle with even after having a YouTube channel for over a year now, but I think that everyone will experience that like cringy feeling of hearing your own voice or seeing yourself on camera. But the more that you do it, the easier it becomes and the more used to it you get. But for voiceovers, I type out a document so that I know what I'm going to say and record. I think that being prepared definitely helps with sounding more confident and just having your message be more concise. Being on camera is definitely a little bit more difficult because obviously I don't want to be like visibly reading off a script or anything like that because I want to be addressing the camera, obviously. And so with these, I do try to like mentally have an idea of what I'm going to say before I hit record. But usually what ends up happening is I'll do several takes. And so that is really like the beauty of being responsible for all of the content creation yourself is that you can record and do as many takes as you like, and then you can edit together the best parts. So if you do or say anything embarrassing, there is a lot of reassurance knowing that you can just like leave those parts out. So I think that in and of itself really helps with appearing more confident or giving you that confidence boost is knowing that like you don't have to nail it in one take. You can do several takes and then just pick the best one. What is the best advice for starting a new YouTube channel? I think I've said this in a previous video, but my main advice is to create the content that you are passionate about and interested in making. And don't obsess over numbers. I know it's easier said than done, but try not to. And don't focus on popularity. Focus more on being your authentic self and connecting with your audience in a genuine way that makes sense for you. I know this might sound arbitrary, but there are so many different ways to create YouTube content and so much different types of content out there. So I hope this makes sense. Is there another social media platform that would help in spreading my art? So there are tons of different platforms for you to share your work. However, they might not all make sense for you. So Instagram, I think is a no brainer since it is a platform that was originally designed for images. Obviously it has changed a lot, but it is still a widely used platform. Other platforms like uh, Twitter and Facebook, I believe are still pretty popular, but I don't personally use those. And then things like Tumblr and DeviantArt, while 
are, I think, a little bit more image and art driven, I don't think they're quite as popular anymore. YouTube, TikTok, and Twitch are all video and live stream based platforms, which I think really allow you to reach a wide audience and also build a stronger connection to them. But it is a much more time consuming thing to take on. And, you know, that type of content just takes so much more effort to create. I currently only have experience with YouTube, but let me tell you, it has totally changed the game for me. So to put into perspective, I have had my Instagram page for several years and I am currently at 99K followers. I have had my YouTube channel for like a year and a half and I have 111K subscribers. So obviously growth on YouTube for me has been much faster. Obviously this is just my own experience and video creation might not be something you're comfortable with or able to do, but if you can do it, I definitely recommend it. How do you feel when people say that they're inspired by you? Of course, I'm always incredibly flattered when people say that they've created something because they were inspired by, you know, either just from my YouTube videos, seeing my process or a particular piece that I've made. And it is, it makes me especially happy when I hear that I help motivate people to either like pick up art again, if they haven't for a long time or try a new medium, things like that really like, val like validate the effort that I make into my YouTube channel and the, you know, and just sharing my work online in the first place. And yeah, I just think that especially during this difficult time, being creative, I think is a great way to yeah bring some joy into your life. How are you holding up so far in 2021? It's been exactly a month and certainly has been a roller coaster. Of course, having my own studio space has been really exciting, but you know, as everyone else is experiencing it, living in quarantine can be hard and we're almost at a year of this, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and now that I live alone, it can be pretty isolating at times because sometimes I'll go several days without speaking to another human being face to face. <laughs> but Generally, I am very, very fortunate and grateful to be able to work from home. And I understand that I am so lucky to be in the position that I am in. What's your favorite self-care activity? Oh, definitely being a couch potato and watching my favorite feel good TV shows and movies. It is definitely my ideal way to de-stress because it really is a form of escapism. I can just fully become invested in the world and stories and characters and just, you know, temporarily forget all of my problems. <laughs> Does the pandemic impact your motivation on everyday life? Yes, especially because I live alone and work from home as a self-employed artist, all of the days really blur together and it can feel very monotonous. So sometimes I'm just like, can I just hibernate until this is all over? <laughs> What's your favorite place slash region in Canada? Admittedly, I have a very, very limited experience with Canada, even though I have lived here my whole life. I really have only been in Southern Ontario and I have visited Montreal, basically. It would be nice to one day travel around and visit other regions and other places in Canada. I've definitely heard great things about BC, so that would probably be the next on my list. Favorite boba flavor? I switch it up pretty often. I, I go to like so many different ones cause Toronto has like a ton of different bubble tea places. But the last one I went to, which was like back in the summer, I got some kind of brown sugar milk tea and that was delicious. Do you sleep with socks on? Only if I'm really, really cold. Opinions on frogs. The internet's obsession with frogs and froggy aesthetic is so adorable and I'm definitely here for it. Really want to know what type of witch you would be. 
I think being a potion maker would be really cool, but I did terribly in science class, so I don't think I would technically be very good at it, but I do like the idea of it. <laughs> what do you think of e-girls? I am so old, I had to Google when e-girl was. <laughs> I mean, they definitely look stylish, so I'll give them that. I don't have TikTok, so that's probably why I didn't really understand or know about that subculture. Favorite part of doing makeup? Definitely doing my eyeshadow. It's very reminiscent of painting and drawing, so that's probably why. What's your fashion style? Honestly, I feel like I flip-flop between wanting to be super pastel and feminine, and then simultaneously, I also really love just exuding like bad bitch energy, <laughs> but Obviously in quarantine, I've mostly just been wearing oversized t-shirts and sweatpants all day, every day. So fashion style like is non-existent at this point. Is there a style slash clothing you love but never dare to wear? Or are you afraid of anything fashion wise? So there are a lot of types of clothing that I really love, but I don't think would be personally flattering on me, but Something that I definitely don't think I could ever do is anything that is strapless. I'm, you know, a little bit busty, so I don't think a strapless top or dress would comfortably work for me. <laughs> What's your favorite thing you've bought for yourself recently? It's been a few months now, but I have to say it's my mechanical keyboard, which a lot of you were really into in my studio tour last week. It's just so pastel and pink and adorable. And I used to have a really crappy keyboard previously that was like the keys were sticking and it was awful. So anyway, this thing was kind of expensive, but I figured I might as well invest in something that will last a long time and be cute AF. So anyway, I'm in love with it and I think it was totally worth it. Do you believe in aliens? I mean, I don't have a tangible idea of what I think is actually out there, but I definitely think it would be pretty arrogant of me to think that there isn't some kind of other life form or beings out there in the great wide galaxy. So yeah, I think that there's probably gotta be something out there. Would you say that you had a good or bad or in between childhood? Honestly, I had a pretty good child childhood. I was raised by a very hardworking single mother who immigrated here to Canada for a better life for her and her kids. And, you know, I, I will always be eternally grateful for that. I never, you know, I never went to summer camp or vacations or anything like that. But, you know, I was happy and comfortable. And when I look back at my childhood, I have very fond memories of it. So I think that's, you know, all one can really ask for. Tell us something embarrassing from your childhood. Okay, so the first one that comes to mind was when I was at the playground with some friends and you know, all the quote unquote big kid swings were taken. I don't remember if it was a dare or me just being dumb, but at some point I decided to squeeze myself into the baby swing, which you know, I was not the right size for said baby swing. I was, you know, like, too old for it. Somehow I made it in successfully, but the problem was I didn't know how to get out of it. And after much struggle, eventually either someone called for help or this man just happened to see the scene unfolding. But anyway, said man, his backyard faced the playground. And so he hopped his fence and had to hoist me out of this baby swing. Total stranger, by the way, nobody knew him. <laughs> it was so embarrassing and dumb but you know, totally harmless in the end. And you know what? I hope that guy is living his best life and doing well because he saved me from uh, being stuck in that swing forever. What is your favorite dance move? Aw, man, this question makes me both happy and sad because I used to love going out dancing with my friends, but obviously have not been able to do so in a very, very long time. But anyway, I don't have a favorite dance move. I don't think I'm a good dancer, but I like going dancing. Maybe one day I'll take dance lessons for fun and find out. <laughs> Any night out stories? All right, 
I had to think about this one so that I didn't uh, reveal anything, you know, incriminating in any way. <laughs> but so one year during college, my roommate and I thought it would be fun to dress up as the guys from LMFAO. Do you remember them? They had like a few mega hits in the early 2010s. Anyway, Party Rock Anthem was the song that was played at every party and every club at that time. So if you remember, that music video involved a choreographed dance number. And so leading up to Halloween weekend, my roommate and I spent some time learning that dance from the video. We were basically like doing the TikTok thing before TikTok was a thing. <laughs> so anyway, at the house party, my other friend knew we learned this dance. And so he put the song on and we busted out that choreography at the party. It was a very, very fun evening and we looked ridiculous. We had like curled and teased our hair to like be like super big. And I had these like obnoxious leopard print leggings. Anyway, it was, it was so silly. <laughs> Favorite season 13 queen on RuPaul's Drag Race so far? Ooh, okay, so we're now at like episode four or five, I think. And currently Simone is definitely my top favorite. And I also really like uh, Utica, Gottmik, and Denali. And I have also been watching the UK season as well. And I am fully and utterly obsessed with Taste. She is seriously so gorgeous and hypnotizing. Can't even comprehend it. Uh, and I also love Tia Coffee, who is so funny and endearing. Do you prefer to draw animated characters or real people for fan art? I really enjoy doing fan art for both, but I do think that I lean towards preferring uh, animated characters. I think it's because most of the time their character designs are just like more fun and interesting since they're not limited to reality in any way. First fictional crush. Most definitely Tuxedo Mask in Sailor Moon. And then as far as live action character, I believe it was Robin in the 90s Batman movies. I guess I was high key into guys with masks. <laughs> Have you watched The Vampire Diaries? If so, what are your thoughts? Yes, I used to regularly watch The Vampire Diaries way back in the day when it was airing. And I was very much into high, uh, vampires in high school, so definitely right up my alley. And looking back at it, I just remembered always thinking, damn, to even be considered for this show, you have also got to be like model material because every single character was just like impossibly beautiful. But anyway, at some point I stopped watching it and I honestly don't really remember a lot of the plot points, but something in my gut is telling me that Bonnie deserved better. My memory of this series is so foggy, but I feel like Bonnie deserved better. <laughs> Do you ever watch dramas like Korean, Chinese, Thai, etc.? I don't actually, but my mom loves them. And I also remembered she used to watch a ton of Bollywood movies too. Who's your favorite character from Shrek and which one is most similar to you? Oh my God, whoever asked this question, shout out to you because this is so funny. Um, so Donkey definitely has to be my favorite. I feel like I use the quote, I like that boulder. That's a nice boulder. <laughs> More often than one would think. I quote that like all the time. Favorite Avatar The Last Airbender book. So the entire series is obviously phenomenal. I think I could probably talk about this series all day, every day. I mean, I think I've mentioned Avatar in every one of these Q&A videos, but I ain't mad at it. I think that I would say the final book, Fire, is my favorite. Zuko's redemption is just so heartwarming and really satisfying. Your opinion on Legend of Korra. So as we've established in every one of these videos, I love Avatar. I think I've talked about Legend of Korra before as well, but I will answer again because I don't remember. Anyway, I definitely was like so excited and invested when Korra was airing at the time and the animation is incredible. And I think that the premise of it was really good. I liked the contrast that they wanted to give by having Korra in a lot of ways be like the opposite of Aang and give it a new dynamic. 
I also thought that the conflict between benders and non-benders was a really interesting concept. Unfortunately, I heard that the studio only gave the showrunners like one season at a time, and so I think that really prevented them from telling an overarching story like they did with Avatar, and it really explains why each season was essentially self-contained. And so I think that really limited them in their ability to storytell. That being said, I don't think Legend of Korra is bad, but for me, it just didn't compare to Avatar. I have found myself re-watching Avatar many, many times over over the years, and it like never ceases to capture my attention. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the characters are just like really well rounded and nuanced, and I just never felt the same investment in watching Korra and in their characters. And I just yeah, I was never compelled to return to the series and rewatch it. So, alas. Favorite TV series at the moment? I don't think I would call it my favorite per se, but I have been recently enjoying the Amazon TV show, The Boys. It's pretty entertaining and an interesting take on superheroes and the toxicity of celebrity. What has been especially fun about watching the show is that as far as I can tell, the majority of the filming happened here in Toronto. And yeah, when I first started watching it, I was like, everything feels so familiar. And then I began to like recognize a lot of locations and buildings. So it's been like a fun little Easter egg hunt while I watch it. Anime you've enjoyed recently, Demon Slayer. It is freaking fantastic. If you saw my last Ohuhu Draw With Me video, you'll already know that I really like it. Uh, the opening theme song is just like so good. And of course, I adore the character designs, the whole lore of the series, and the animation is incredible. And also, I have been slowly watching the newest season of Haikyuu. I've been like trying to extend it because I'm like gonna be sad when I like finish. So anyway, I adore that series. It is so wholesome. It makes me really happy. How do you feel about the Hashiras from Demon Slayer? Rengoku is my favorite. They definitely seem really interesting. Gyu Tomioka is actually my favorite Demon Slayer character. And when I heard that he got a side story manga, I had to go read it. Uh, but yeah, I have yet to actually read the main manga. So other than that little side story, my familiarity with the Hashiras only from the anime thus far. I have not seen the movie yet, but I believe uh, Ren Goku has been featured pretty heavily as far as I can tell. So I definitely look forward to watching it. Uh, I mentioned in my other video that I know a major spoiler, so I'm like brace myself for that. <laughs> Favorite Sailor Moon character? Man, this question is always tricky because they're all great, but when I was little, watching Sailor Moon for the first time, Sailor Mercury was my favorite, but now I think it's a toss up between Jupiter and Mars. Jupiter, because I love her duality and her personality of being, you know, like a masculine tough girl who beats guys up, but then she's also got her like traditionally feminine side of enjoying cooking and baking. And then of course, Mars is just so sassy and fiery. I can't resist that. Who is your favorite Naruto character and why? Okay, so I used to be obsessed with Naruto when I was in high school, and then eventually I just fell off the train at some point during Shippuden. But that being said, I recently decided to rewatch it from the beginning out of curiosity, and it has been very fun. Back in high school, Sasuke was my favorite because, of course, I was going for like all the moody emo boys. However, upon rewatch, as an adult, mind you, I'm not very far, so I'm sure this answer is subject to change as I like progress into the series again, but it's a toss up between Kakashi and Rock Lee. Kakashi, obviously super cool. I feel like I don't really need to elaborate. And Rock Lee, oh my God, I was not expecting to love him this much. He is so earnest and definitely the underdog that you just have to root for. I don't know what it is. I thought he was so goofy and weird when I watched it in high school, but now I freaking love him. Anyway, I'm looking forward to getting into Shippuden at some point because I never did end up finishing it. So it, some of it will be like entirely new to me. And it's been so long that like I probably forgot all of it. 
thoughts on the new Yashe Hime, Princess of Half Demon? The ending song is so good. So I did talk about this in my Sashomaru screenshot redraw video that I did a couple of months ago, but I'll reiterate it here. So I love Inuyasha, humongous fan of this series. And Yashihime is the sequel to Inuyasha. Anyway, I really don't think I'm going to watch it. I'm not super big into sequels that like follow the children of the original characters of the story. So yeah. Unfortunately, probably will never see it. Hence why I also will not be watching Baroto either. <laughs> Have you ever watched Jojo's Bizarre Adventure? Only the first episode. I know it is a very popular series and people are pretty diehard for it. I actually remember tabling at an anime convention with my friend uh, last year, two years ago, and she has all Jojo fan art. And I remembered asking, which one is Jojo? And she replied, they're all Jojo, which certainly got me intrigued and confused. So a few months ago, I decided to watch the first episode since it's on Netflix. And initially I was like, okay, I kind of dig this like early 80s, 90s art style. But then, uh, I don't know. I'm so sorry, Jojo fans. I just... I don't know, the first episode, I didn't find any of the characters likable or appealing. I know that, you know, a first episode is probably not a accurate representation of the entire series, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it alone, but maybe I'll come back to it eventually. What's your fan cast for a live action remake of your favorite anime? Okay, so... I think that this is a really cool and fun question, but unfortunately, I'm not really big on live action remakes of animated shows. My favorite anime is Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and they technically did do a live action remake of that, and I was like, no, thank you. I, <laughs> I've never seen any anime remakes, whether it be American or Japanese. I don't know, they just look kind of cringy. And I have seen a handful of the new Disney live action remakes and they just never come close to the original so i don't know it's just not for me unfortunately thoughts on bakugo well he is actually my favorite character in boku no hero academia when i first started watching the series i remembered being like so appalled by his character because i was like oh my god he's so mean he's such a bully and i remembered being particularly surprised because my friend who had already been into the series told me that Bakugo was her favorite character. And I was like, what? He is awful. And then over time you realize that there's actually something very lovable about him. And so now he also is my favorite character. And I have been keeping up to date with the manga and he is exhibiting so much character growth and it makes me so happy. And I saw the trailer for season five, which makes me so excited because this particular arc is probably like one of my favorites. I'm really, really excited about it because Shinso is also a new favorite of mine too. If you were in Boku no Hero Academia, what would your quirk be? This question is so fun. Okay, so I thought about this a lot. I think I would really want to have the ability of camouflage. Similar to like a chameleon, I'd want to be able to change my appearance to blend into my surroundings. And then as an extension of that power, I would also be able to activate that ability on other inanimate objects for a period of time or another person or being if I was touching or holding onto them so that we could both be in camouflage. I think that this would be my ideal type of power since I'm not physically strong or co uh, uh, coordinated, nor do I like confrontation. So this would be a very useful quirk for like stealthy operations and whatnot. Favorite Full Metal Alchemist character? Definitely Ling slash Greed. I thought they made for such a fun dynamic and I thought that it was really interesting that Greed was the only homunculus that wanted independence from father, but also went against him basically. Also, I love Olivier Armstrong. She is such a badass. Have you ever gotten a rush of motivation after watching an anime with a positive main character? 
Oh, definitely. I mean, I it's it's no surprise at this point. I love making fan art. I think it's a great way to show your appreciation for something that you love, and it's also really fun to interpret characters in your own style. And I also get a lot of inspiration from like TV shows and series that I really enjoy. So yeah, definitely I have gained so much uh, motivation and inspiration for anime over the years and just like any animated series in general that I've enjoyed. All right, and that pretty much wraps up today's Q&A video. I hope that you had fun hanging out with me, chit-chatting about art, life, and pop culture stuff. I am going to have this painting available in my shop when I decide to open it. I'm not 100% sure when that's going to be exactly. I'm hoping to maybe make a few more small originals like this and open my shop maybe in March, fingers crossed, but don't hold me to that. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.